Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a third submission by Victoria of her horse, Vinny. Now, on the lunge line here, in our last uh, session with this horse, he was much too slow and a little unfocused, so we're certainly doing a much better job here. Now, the one thing I see just right away that you need to start doing is uh, look where you are looking. You need to start looking at the back end of the horse. So when we lunge, we really want our focus to be mostly on the hindquarters. And even here, I can see even the way you, it looks like you're looking straight forward. So you want to keep your eyes on the back end of the horse. That's what you want to focus on. Of course, you want to have a sort of soft gaze at the entire horse. But where you really want to be putting your focus is on the back end. So you watch, we're watching the hocks or watching the hind legs, see how deeply they step under the body. And of course, that's where the focus of the drive is. That's where the energy is. And that's where when we learn to ride correctly, we learn to ride from the back to the front. So... Once again, that's what we want to start paying attention to, watching the back end of the horse and not the front end of the horse. Unfortunately, today in dressage, people have even got the idea, people ever talk about horses being round, but they're usually just meaning that the neck is pulled over and round. But of course, we know that to be round, the horse has to be lifting its back. We're talking about the entire length of the horse's top line being round, not just the neck. So once again, that's where we want to focus. And just watching you here, I can see this even coming around the corner here. Your head should be looking at the back end of the horse so that we can see what that's doing. And see, as, as you've come around here, the corner, I can see that you're clearly looking at the front end or, the, or, the, uh, or his head instead of the back end. So much more focus on the back end. And this is much better, and your lunging here is much more focused than it was in the last video. We just need to get you focusing on the important parts here. And you're certainly closer to the horse and working a little more active. Now, you see how he's going around with his shoulders or rather to the outside. So what you've got to focus on now, and once again, that's part of you know, putting your visual focus on the back end of the horse, is that he's just swinging the shoulders to the outside and therefore evading that gymnastic quality of bringing his inside hind leg further under the body and lifting up to the back a little more. So you want to focus on that back end and try to get the horse lunging so both ends are on the same circle instead of what you're doing here. He's kind of constantly drifting around with his head to the outside a little bit here. But once again, it's a lot better, a lot more focused than it was in the last video that we saw. But once again, that's going to improve a great deal when you start looking at the back end, focusing more on that and getting him to swing through a little more actively. So once again, that walk, I would have liked to have seen it uh, deeper and more swinging, a little more focused. I would have liked to have seen you pushing the shoulders, uh, pushing the hindquarters out there a little bit. And once again, trying to get a little more active. But this is certainly better than what we saw in the first video. So same thing here. Once again, you see how he comes around the corner, how you see you kind of looking to the left. And you look like you're looking either ahead of him or at his... At his uh, face there. So we've got to get you focusing much more on the back end. Now having said that, this is already though looking better than the last video that we saw. This is a better relaxation. He's starting to swing. But even here we'd like to see you ask him to be a little more active. And just like in the walk, we want you to push his hindquarters a little further away. That is, we want both ends of the horse to go in the same circle. You can see that clearly how he comes around the corner there and you can see how the shoulders are pulled outside of the line of the, of the hindquarters. So there's where you'd want to focus on his back end and just send that back end away from you a little bit, even working him on a little smaller circle till you can get him to yield the hindquarters a little more. And of course, that's just the beginning of doing a leg yield, just as you would when you ride. So just like when we ride, you can't really make a circle until you can leg yield. Same thing is true on the lunge line. You've got to get him moving those hindquarters over, <clears throat> and that is yielding his body and yielding the hindquarters um, so that he'll push both ends out onto the same circle. Same thing here. You can see how he comes around. You don't have quite enough contact with the rein, so he's just kind of drifting around there. And once again, you can see how far out the shoulders are out to the left of the hindquarters. However, even just what you're doing has resulted in a better horse than what we saw in the, in the first two videos of this horse. We just like this to swing a little more active. Now, uh, Victoria had said that she hasn't, uh, the summer was very rough on them due to her schedule and the heat in Phoenix. So we had a similar situation here in San Diego where we had the longest, hottest summer I can ever remember. And we always have to remember that, yes, we do have to alter our training schedule. And once again, you know, we, we never want to work horses if we can avoid it into a lather, you know, when they're too hot. I mean, heat is much harder on horses than cold. Always remember that. Horses can sustain and be perfectly happy in very cold temperatures, but... You know, heat is very, very hard on them. 
So we do have to adapt what we do and just uh, do less of it when it's really hot. So you certainly did the right thing. And once again, if you're working at least three or four days, you have to be working a horse at least three days a week in order to see real improvement because otherwise you just simply are not getting enough. You know, it's like somebody who goes to the gym once a week. It's, you know, yes, it's better than not going to the gym at all. But, you know, if you really want to get in shape, you've got to at least work out three days a week. And that same thing is true of the horse. But once again, even though this isn't perfect yet, the trot is looking better. He's starting to swing a little deeper, starting to stretch a little deeper into the contact. So this is all quite good. Well, I feel like when you get right there, that's what we're looking for. Now, we just like to add a little bigger trot to that, but not a whole lot. So I would, I would rather see you err on the side of caution here, so to speak, uh, than to suddenly you know, get him all whipped up into a frenzy, as we see so many people doing with horses on lunge lines, thinking that lunging is just running horses around in a circle. It is not at all. We want every step on the lunge line to be controlled, just like we want every step on, uh, under saddle to be controlled. Why? Because we want to control what the horse does with his body to keep it from injuring itself. And once again, you've got to remember that when we keep horses in stalls, you know, they become very dependent on us because they're not used to being out, you know, uh, in a cross-country situation or open land kind of situation where they're having where they actually learn to deal with holes in the ground and this sort of thing and all the things that horses encounter when they're out in in large pasture kind of things you know that aren't regulated you know not not everybody has beautiful grass pastures like they have you know in Kentucky or somewhere like that where they're beautifully fenced and there's no holes and this sort of thing uh, unfortunately a lot of horses in the wild would not have that you know privilege of having such uh, refined footing all the time so they learn to deal with different things and rocks and pay attention but a horse that lives in a stall also develops a lot of fitness so it's up to us to teach them how to burn that fitness off you know in a constructive manner rather than just coming out and and running like a lunatic until they're, until they're tired. Of course, once again, once you understand that anything that you do with the horse not over its back is going to have a very detrimental effect on its legs so uh, if you take a horse out and lunge it, you know, for hours at a time, and which is what happens if you don't lunge for control, if you don't lunge as if you're riding, so to speak, but just lunge horses to tire them out, it just takes longer and longer to reach that place where they're tired out because they get fitter and fitter. It's a very simple uh, thing to understand. So we have to watch that, and uh, the fitness is always an equation that we have to bring into part of what we do when we consider training horses. In other words, we don't want our fitness level to get ahead of our control level. If it does, then we have a horse that's kind of running wildly. So always bear that in mind. So once again, I really like the fact that you, you're working so much closer to the horse now. You've got a little, get a little more focus on his back end. You see how he's still just trying to swing his hindquarters. So remember when a horse is trying to pull the shoulders to the outside, it's trying to swing its hindquarters toward you, just like horses, if you see them in pasture, how they threaten one another by swinging their hindquarters around, like saying, oh, come near my hay and I'm going to kick you. Well, the horses do the same thing on the lunge line. When they keep trying to but pull to the outside, they're trying to turn their hindquarters to you so that they can double blast you if they get the opportunity. And that's what we have to teach them is not acceptable. So the same problem you're having here of him spinning is, is part of that problem of not look, look where you're looking here. You're looking forward and ahead. You should be looking at the hindquarters all the time at the hocks and occasionally glancing forward to see what's happening with the neck and that sort of thing. But so it's not like riding because you know when riding we have to look ahead to see where we're going and even when we ride we don't want to get become one of these riders who stares down all the time staring at the back of the neck trying to figure out whether the horse is going around or not. But we learn to feel it. But here is a good time to study on the lunge line to study what's happening and that's where you have to get your focus on the back end. And like you saw he kicked out at you uh, back there a few moments ago and spun out on you. That's exactly the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. So what you're doing with your whip there, you want to turn that whip around in your hand and point it towards the horse and keep it there until the horse yields those hindquarters. Like right now, your whip is in a position that's not doing any, you any good and he's now falling behind the leg and getting slower and slower. So you need to turn that whip towards the horse and keep it there. Now once the horse gets in the zone, so to speak, and you get good movement out of him, and you get good bend and stretch, then you can back off with the whip a little bit. That is, turn it away from him a little bit as long as he continues to work in that same frame. But if he does not, then you have to keep it back towards him. So right here you, is where you need to keep the whip towards him. See how far out his shoulders are pulled. So you've got to get the hindquarters to yield away from you more. And of course the way you do that is being close enough with the horse of the whip. Occasionally the horse has to feel the whip. And if he kicks out at you, of course you've got to be quick enough to tap him again with it. 
And of course, once again, I recommend that everyone who's trying to learn to do this, please go someplace away from your horses and take your lunge whip and learn how to use it and practice with it with both hands until you can hit a target over and over again in the same place. And you want to pl place your target about, remember, we want to mostly tap the horse when we do so in that fleshy part of the buttocks there above the hocks. So we need to be able to place that on the horse very accurately, that is place our whip on the horse very accurately. So same thing here, you've got your whip turned backwards, and of course he's just doing kind of what he wants to do, and he's not yielding his hindquarters. So this is where you need to turn that whip around and face it towards the horse. And if you ever have a horse that you do this with and it just goes crazy because, you know, in other words, it's learned, oh, if I act like a nut when someone points a whip at me, they'll stop. Well, in those cases, you have to just lunge the horse until it gets used to it. You have to keep the whip pointed towards it and just let it get over itself, so to speak, because if you back off, that's the horse threatening you. So if you back off every time the horse threatens you uh, by swinging his hindquarters at you and you don't get after and move them away, it's basically bullying you. It's lunging you rather than you lunging it. So the only thing that we have to really insist upon with horses is that they yield away from the contact with the leg, or in this case with the whip. Everything else kind of comes from that. So that's the only thing that we ever really have to insist upon, that is the horse moving away from the leg, at least on some level. Now, on the other hand, I don't advocate you know, trying to make a horse jump out of its skin every time it, you touch it with your legs. That's also is just as much a mistake as not getting the horse to respond to your leg. Because then the horse just becomes nervous and afraid of the age, which is, of course, why we see so many of these horses that have been rolkered. You know, um, somebody sent a video the other day asking me to comment on an upper-level horse, one that's very famous and, uh, you know, had scored very highly. But, uh, you know, how it scored very highly is <laughs> hard for me to understand. Yes, it's flinging its legs way up in the air, but it's completely hollow in the movements and very, very tense. So tension ought to be the number one thing that people mark down for, as far as I'm concerned. Because, yes, you can get a horse over its back using a technique like roll cur you know, which is basically strangling the horse into submission while you make it super active from your legs, so you get all this sort of tense, uh, high leg action that really doesn't do you any good and totally destroys the horse just as, just as well as just being hollow. So once again, when a horse is tense, its muscles, are, it's no better than having a horse completely hollow because wrong things are happening when the horse is tense, just like any other athlete. If you are a tense athlete, you're never going to be able to to perform very well. And once again, that's why so many sports teams have psychologists and things that work with their team members. Because we must be able to stay relaxed to be able to think. It's like a horse that has started to panic, once again, is not thinking about anything and becomes dangerous. So once again, that lunge work there, the biggest takeaway is you've got to start looking at the back end of the horse, focus more on that, turn your whip towards the horse and keep it there until you can get the horse to yield its hindquarters away from you. But you're getting some good things there. Once again, your technique has improved. You're working closer to the horse. It was more active than we saw in your previous videos. It just still has a little ways to go. But the horse is getting into a pretty reasonable stretch some of the time, just not quite at the point yet where it's staying in the zone, where you can keep that consistently. But once again, I would always rather you err on the side of caution, that is take your time learning how to do these things, rather than try to hurry it all along. So you're doing a good job. If things are improving, then you're on the right track. So getting started with the mounted work here, it's not too bad a walk. I'd like to see a little more swinging. Once again, I'd like to see him stretch deeper down. Now once again, we see this horse in silhouette. You can see the hole there behind the saddle. You can see how his... Uh, the top of his hips there are rather raised, so that shows us that the back has started to fall away from the hips there a little bit. So that shows us how we need to correct that and how much work we need to do before. That's the kind of thing that if you don't notice now, will just get worse and worse, and that's how why we have this epidemic of kissing spine these days, because so few people seem to understand how to work their horses correctly. I mean, when you see upper-level supposed horses, and they look just like this one does, or even worse, with a hole behind the saddle, and those tented hips, as we say, kind of pointed on top of the hip bone. So that shows us the horse has spent most of its life, life taking very shallow, uh, hollow strides. So as the horse develops over its whole top line and starts to develop in the full length of its stride, you'll see all that go away. That is, you'll see that hole go away and, and that bump on top of the croup there will go away because it will fill out with muscle. 
pretty good rhythm in the walk here, just still not quite as deep as we'd like it to go. So this is once again where you'd like to be a little more active. Just take a little more contact. Now when I say a little more contact, I never mean so much that it's trying to pull the horse's head down. Remember when you take contact with a horse, when you're trying to get it to stretch, we're just taking slightly more than the weight of the rein. Um, but we're never trying to pull the horse's head into any position. We're just taking enough contact that the horse will want to figure out a way. To, you know, the horses don't want anything pulling against their mouth at all, which is, of course, why so many horses that are roll curd and, and ridden hard against the hand, why they just check out. They either check out or they go crazy and become these sort of neurotic machines that we see with some of these horses that have been roll curd, how they, they pee off like, uh, like a devil, <laughs> you know, where it's just very fast and very quick. But on the other hand, they have a hard time stopping it, which is often what we see when we saw when the advocates for Rolker were doing so well and we were seeing dressage tests in which horses were no longer even able to halt and yet judges giving them huge scores. So you wonder how that's possible. But happily it seems that the pendulum is beginning to swing in the other direction. So that's a good thing. That is, at least the people doing it uh, correctly are getting a little higher scores these days. So this walk is looking better, still not quite stretched enough, but it's pretty big and active. I like the rhythm of it. It certainly looks a little more like you're going someplace than in the previous videos. Now the one thing I would like to see you do with your position is just to stretch yourself up a little bit, flatten your shoulder blades into your back and just lift your chest up. You're just a little bit collapsed through your middle there. So remember that we have to support ourselves so that we don't ask the horse to support all of our weight down through its back. So. The more we stretch up and carry ourselves in correct posture, the easier the job is for the horse. So it's not bad here. You can see how your shoulders are a little bit rounded forward. You need to just flatten those shoulder blades into your back so your head can come up on top of your shoulders a little more and just lift your chest up a little more. If you've ever done yoga, the yoga where you do a back stretch where you go back as if you're going over a barrel is a good way to feel it. The same thing here, just a little more walk. We want to ask for a little more than what the horse wants to give us. So that gets a little better there. There, and that's starting to stretch a little bit. So you're doing the right things. And once again, I'd rather have you take a while to get there and actually get there correctly than, than to do the opposite. Pretty good leg yield there. Now remember in the leg yield that we always want to keep the shoulder. Now this is the one time we do want to keep the shoulder in a little, just slightly in advance. The reason we do that is that's what keeps the horse from hitting its back legs together. So if the horse starts to lead with the hindquarters doing a half pass or a leg yield, they'll start, they will hit their legs together, which is what we want to avoid. If you watch upper level dressage horses today, you'll see that the half pass is one of the most telling exercise for the horses that are hollow because they literally can't get their hind legs around so they have a funny kind of halting gait when they go into that into the half pass and if you watch the hind legs of, of those kind of horses you'll see that they're really struggling to get their leg through and under because of course if they're hollow the back legs are hanging out behind somewhere no matter how high they're lifting their knees once again remember that how high a horse lifts his knees has nothing to do with collection And once again, this walk is improving as it's going. It's getting more active, getting a little more relaxed. But always remember that as you learn this stuff, just know that your horse is better off being ridden on a loose rein than being trying to forced into into a contact. So it's better to have better to have the horse have no frame at all and just let it move freely as it will than to try to force it into some kind of frame that's only going to make the horse tense or uncomfortable. But we still just need to get a longer, deeper stretch in the walk than what you're getting here. You're having moments where it's coming like that. Good, and that's looking much better. So same thing here. You can see yourself in silhouette. See how rounded your shoulders are down. You just need to flatten those shoulders blades into your back and lift your chest a little bit. Interestingly enough, that when you, once you do that, you'll see your horse will stay ahead of your leg much better. Having some moments where there, then we're starting to stretch a little bit more. But right here, I feel like the horse has gotten too slow. So this is where we'd want to use our legs alternately. Remember in the walk, we always use our legs alternately to ask for a longer walk. 
That is, as we feel the inward swing of the side of the horse, which now happens very naturally, if you do nothing at all, but just walk along and feel how your legs swing from side to side, the, the moment to aid the horse in the walk is as that leg is swinging in. So it's very easy to get the timing of the walk because the legs are naturally moving that way anyway. So what you want to do is just swing on in with that leg as it goes in and bump them on that side and then on the same thing on the other side. Remembering that whenever you usually let your leg, it's never held into the side of the horse. It's used and just completely relaxed. It's never tense. We never hold anything against the horse. Our legs, our hands. So I would have liked to have seen you gotten into a better stretch there in the walk before you went to the trot. And we see how this trot, how the back end is kind of falling out. So here it's not quite active enough. So we'd just like to see you get to a better place before you start the trot. Now I do... Uh, you did the right thing is that you didn't try to hold the horse in any kind of frame between the walk and the trot, which is very good, because remember we never want to try to insist on the frame staying exactly the same between the gates till we can keep it consistently in the gates, and obviously you can't do that with this horse, so it would be completely pointless to try to hold its head down through the transition. But here we just need a lot more activity. You can almost see how the horse is kind of stumbling there a little bit behind. It's just a little bit too slow. So when you get on the horse, even here, you just need to make it a little more active than you're doing here. This is just slightly too slow. But once again, having said that, this all looks better than it did in your previous videos. So you're on the right track. Things are improving. So right there, you just want to send them on a little bit more. Just get a little more activity. Sometimes we just have to send them on, even if it's not completely over the backs, just to get enough movement. Now, we do, there's a point at which we can send them on too fast that kind of drives them onto their forehand. So we're looking for that optimal position where we get the deepest stretch with the longest stride in relaxation. So you can see here how the, I've come around the corner. It's very similar problems you're having riding that you're having lunging, and that he's kind of pulling the shoulders to the outside off the circle that you're riding on. So just think about that. So same thing here, you just need to be more active with that inside leg working out. Every circle should feel like a leg yield. That is, every time you make a circle, it's created by pushing the horse out away from your inside leg. Now that's looking better there. It's getting more active, and by virtue of it, he's starting to stretch a little better. Now this trot is looking much better here. Now you can see how much more regular it's becoming. Now we're beginning to see the top line of the neck, so now it's really improving. Much better rhythm here, even though he's not completely stretched all the time. You're certainly getting a better, more active rhythm. You can certainly see the difference as his head comes up. You see how the hocks don't flex as much. So once again, the head and neck position just facilitates in the beginning the horse moving more accurately behind and getting over its back. It doesn't mean just because the head is down, however, does not necessarily mean the horse is going to be coming through. That's just the position that allows it to happen more easily on an undeveloped animal. Better activity here. This is better. Now that's the point where you'd want to just have a little more contact and just soften him a little bit more. And once again, all you do is just take a little contact and as you feel him want to go down, you let that contact release so the horse learns that the, the release from any contact is going to come if he stretches down. We get that correct contact, which is just slightly more than the weight of the rein, but never a backwards feel against your hand. Now that had some good moments in it, and once coming back to the walk, the walk is even better than it was, so that's a good thing. I would have liked to have seen that stretch get a little deeper, but once again, at those few moments when I told you that it was looking really good, that was much better. Still needs to get deeper in the stretch, both in the walk and the trot, but it's certainly in the right direction. There, now this walk is looking much better. So sometimes that's the issue, I think, with this horse is it, you know, just doing that little bit of a trot work helped you just get a little better walk because you got a little more forward and active. Remember the word forward means to engage forward under the body. It does not necessarily mean to run. So horses that are running are not forward. Horses that are forward engage forward from the back end. That's basically what the old masters meant when they said that. 
but much better walk here in the end than we, than we saw before the trot. So this is improvement. So while your trot was not perfect, it certainly did at least help the walk a little bit, that he got a little more active, a little more swinging. But you certainly are in the right direction in the trot work. I mean, you're almost there. It just needs to get a little more consistent. What you're going to find when you improve these little position problems that I said, just, you're just a little bit round-shouldered. You can see how your, your chest is dropped a little bit. You want to get your head back on top of your shoulders a little more and just flatten those shoulder blades into your back. So in other words, just like you have good posture on the back of a horse, you can see how you're just a little rounded forward. So just that little bit of rounding your shoulders forward and dropping them like that puts more weight on the horse's back. So this is where we have to stretch up. You know, we have to do our part, which is, you know, not to make the horse's job harder by making it making yourself heavier in the saddle. Now, sometimes when a horse is taking off with it or something, then we might want to do that. But in most schooling, we don't. Now, this walk is getting much better here. Now, this is the best thing we've seen yet. Look how much further it's tracking over the body and how much more regular it's becoming. So that was getting to be a much better walk. Now I like to see the fact that you just let him stop to relieve himself. Very important that we don't get horses afraid to do that in the ring. As I said, we've run, a few, we've run across a few horses in our lives that were actually had been made afraid to go to the bathroom. So the whole time you rode them, they just felt like you know they had a cork up them, <laughs> you know, and very stiff and unhappy. So you always want to let them do that. As, as they improve in training, they get better at just being able to keep moving. But it's kind of an unnatural thing for horses, except when they're excited. If you ever watch them in a the field, you know, they rarely run and, and relieve themselves at the same time. And this is running from fear. Because we always get a better trot after that. The horse relieves itself. And once again, when it does, you feel how it lifts its back. So the fact that, you know, once in a while, usually we'll see horses once the first time, as soon as they start stretching over the back, it will, they'll relieve themselves. Because once again, when the back is down, that tightens everything inside. So once again, how important this is to your horse's health, um, not only of the physical health, but the internal health of the internal organs. Once again, when the horse works correctly over its back, it lifts its abdominal wall and massages those internal organs, just as a... It does for a human being that learns to engage the core. You're going to be a lot healthier if we support our, our uh, internal organs. Well, the horse is exactly the same way. And if they don't, we can also lead to colics. I mean, it's very interesting when you see, you know, there's definitely a correlation if you ask any veterinarian, you know, the cruelest trainers have the most, the most colics because the horses sit in the stalls and worry about what they're doing or when the person's coming to torture them again, kind of like a person with Stockholm Syndrome. It's the same thing. So a horse that's brought out every day and tortured by somebody hanging on its mouth and beating on it sits in a stall and worries about when that's going to happen again. Instead of looking forward to coming out, the horse, a, correct, a correctly trained horse should look forward to his work, workout and his exercise, and they will. And they'll show you that by becoming enthusiastic about it rather than just resisting it. So once again, trot here just needs to be stretched a little more, but you're certainly on track. Here I'd like to just see you send a little more forward. A bad little leg yield there. And, you know, and as you did that little bit of a leg yield there, you can see how the horse kind of sped up and got a little deeper under his body. So that's exactly what you want to do. This is Will Faber from Art to Ride. Great job. See you next time.